May I have your attention, please? It's my uh, privilege to introduce Wes Chapman, our speaker today. Uh, Wes Chapman is an old friend of Dartmouth, graduated magna cum laude uh, from Dartmouth. That's Latin for a good job. <laughs> also graduated from Tux MBA program, uh, a born businessman with close ties to Thayer School. Uh, he has contributed lectures to classes in medical instrumentation here. That was uh, Keith uh, Paulson's class. Um, he also has taken over a fledgling business, which was a initially a Thayer School spin-off, and uh, brought it to a successful and, more importantly, profitable uh, state. Uh, for the sake of full disclosure, I have known West for, uh, West for some time now. He once hired me as a consultant on, uh, uh, for his company, MMS, which now is M2S. Uh, when I invited Wes to come to the Jones Seminar, I had in mind the following thoughts. Not all great ideas turn into uh, profitable businesses, and I asked Wes to explore that. Um, I expect this might be of interest to some of the MEM students and certainly for the PhD innovation track students. Uh, last item I wanted to remind you out of uh, consideration for our speaker, please do not use your laptops if you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Make this work. Is that going at this point? Can you hear me? Sounds great. Great. Super. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alex, very much for having me. Uh, I was saying when I came in that we used to do this in the geology department. And to get people to come on a Friday afternoon would have a keg of beer, and the place would be full. It was just, by the end of the lecture, however, it was fairly raucous. You couldn't keep anybody in the chair. Things got out of hand occasionally. Um, look, thank you very much for coming. One of the things I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the old medical media systems, which came out of there originally. Uh, my good friend and the Dean Emeritus of this institution uh, kicked it off in the early mid-90s. Uh, we turned it into Medical Metric Solutions in, our, in uh, 2004 to sell it. And one of the things that I found, particularly on a Friday afternoon, is if you ask some questions and try and get the audience to participate a little bit, uh, it keeps people more lively and engaged than just a straight talk. A couple things, a few things I'd like you to think about is, this is the roadshow presentation that we use to sell this company. Uh, for the folks who were in Alex's class, they got a chance to read the offering memorandum. And this was a company which was a real basket case when I took it over. It's not unusual. That uh, happens a lot. Uh, you know, it had a million dollars of unpaid bills. Uh, they'd missed the Christmas payroll. They had $17 in the bank. And uh, the CEO, who was a friend of mine, went down to Anguilla to watch the fireworks for the change of the millennia. Uh, he never came back. The um, I took it over and we got it refinanced and got it fixed up and we'll go into a little bit about what took place but the concept here is, uh, is technology is not enough. There's a lot of other stuff that has to take place in a company to make it go and I wanted to ask some questions about that. Uh, what risk factors can you identify out of this uh, presentation? What questions does it raise that you want answered? You know, imagine that you're taking a look at this company and saying, what's this thing worth? Do I want to buy it? Do I want to invest in it? Because that's what this uh, presentation was for. And fortunately, it was successful. What are the key elements of value in this company? Does the technology really count? Look at the presentation and say, what are, what's this guy actually selling? People bought this. Um, how many bids do you think this thing generated? Who do you think the buyers were? How much do you think the company's worth? You'll see some numbers. Uh, give it some thought because you know the issue here is engage with the presentation. Imagine you're putting some money into this thing. What are the risk factors? Do you want to do it? Would you buy it? A couple of key concepts before we get into the presentation. And I wanted to do this simply because I was with, I started a new company and the thing is off and running. We're having a lot of fun. Hello, boomers. Nice to see you. I'm glad you could make it. Um, I was at a presentation with a recently minted partner, and he was complaining bitterly that the FDA, that CMS wouldn't accept 
the FDA approval, 510K approval, in terms of giving him reimbursement. When you're dealing with medical companies, and that's what I'm here to talk about today, it's critically important that you understand at least the bare bones of the regulatory structure that these things have to fit into. The FDA, two words. When you think about FDA, if you think about, remember, two words, you'll be okay. Safe and effective. That's really what they're all about. Is it safe and is it effective? And that's everything that they do is really focused on that. If you're talking about foodstuffs, they throw in wholesome. But we're not talking about wholesome foodstuffs here. We're talking about medical products. For CMS, which is Medicare, remember, CMS governs two-thirds of the medical dollars in the United States of America. The questions are, is it reasonable and is it necessary? Because if it's not reasonable and it's not necessary, they're not going to pay for it. And if they don't pay for it, you don't have a company. <clears throat> what was M2S? M2S made these images. This is a seriously diseased aorta. Uh, this is an axial CT slice through it. And what, the, what we did was come up with these computer models. This is thrombus, which is a non-calcified plaque. Uh, the red is lumen or blood flow. The, uh, looking around, these are some measurements that we've taken. And there's a little bit of calcified plaque up there in the neck. Uh, this particular disease state for many years was repaired by an open repair where they'd slice you open, go inside, and effectively stitch in a piece of sailcloth. Uh, this is a tremendous trauma to the body. This is typically a disease state of older people. And they came up with an endovascular repair where you put in a stent graft. This is a fundamentally different engineering problem than a stent. A stent is designed to open up an occluded artery. This is designed to seal it off. Um, these are the investment highlights that were part of the presentation. Uh, we were the market leader, and we didn't know how much of the market we had at the time, and we'll get to the market in a minute. Uh, anatomical metrics endorsed as a standard of care. I didn't realize it at the time, but this was a really big deal. It was really the first time that anatomical metrics had moved from a clinical trial platform into a clinical platform seamlessly. Uh, leverage technology in multiple markets. That's the question here for you people to ponder when you look at this presentation. Does this company really have leverageable technology in multiple markets? And if so, what's it dependent on? Strong customer base, 250 leading hospitals, 900 physicians. It was considerably bigger than that a year and a half later. This company, from a market entry perspective with the product that we had, was tremendously successful. No question about it, hands down. Profitable, uh, one of the things that we did with this company was we drove it like crazy from a financial perspective. For this company to be sold, I felt very strongly that I never got the kind of feedback on the technology. It was dependent upon a bunch of reimbursement. There were a whole bunch of things that needed to happen here. Let's make it profitable. And so we were absolute savages about costs. And we had a team of people that hung in there and got this thing done. Uh, this I won't read too much about, but I do want to focus on a couple points here. Uh, FDA involvement and ISO. We were leaders in quality, leaders in ISO, and it made a big difference in terms of the market receptivity to this company. For people who don't know what ISO is, it's the International Standards Organization. It has a very big footprint in uh, manufacturing and are increasingly large in service. Uh, it's a fundamental part of what I'm doing next. Uh, FDA 510K clearance is a class two medical device. This was something in the past that when you got this, it was a uh, ticket to the chest of gold. And increasingly, over time, the FDA and CMS teamed up to make that more difficult. Medicare reimbursement. This was really what made our company unique. Uh, it was, the at the time we got it, the only uh, radiographic additional service that ever got additional reimbursement. And it remains so to this day. It was a case of one that ever made it work. 
11 patents. And one of the things that you know, I want to emphasize to you folks is this company had a robust patent portfolio. And it's grown more robust over time. And a lot of these were really good ideas. How much were they worth is a separate question. A uh, couple key elements of value, 510k status. What does this mean and what's it worth? Does anybody here know what 510k status means? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Brave souls in the back. Let me put you on the spot. Boomer. No, no idea. Phil, oh, here we go. Correct. It depends on a predicate. Uh, it's typically done for class two products, although it can be for class three. Class three is the highest level. Uh, it's a uh, type of clearance which is getting harder and harder to get today. The FDA is not interested in 510K. They're not interested in predicate-based devices. And to my absolute delight, if they grant them, they're requiring additional clinical evidence. Everything that's being done today is being done with a gathering of clinical evidence. Uh, and the question is, what's it worth? You know, we got, or the company had gotten 510K status in 1997, and uh, it never really turned into very much. CMS reimbursement. Uh, M2S had a G code, which is a type of CPT code granted by the government for a particular uh, service, a particular type of practice. Uh, anybody want to take a stab at what CPT stands for? Common practice terminology. Uh, it's how you make reference to this is what we're doing to this patient. Patent status, what's it worth? Well, let's figure it out. This was a data production process at the company. Took a CT scan brought them in through a bunch of uh, different methods. This was our proprietary method here. Put them through a proprietary process here and sent them back to the clinician either through the armored car uh, or through PEMS. Now PEMS turned out to be something uh, which was of enormous value which we never got paid for. It was a internet-based registry which was the method that most of these docs accessed these images. And it provided for a fairly robust post-process uh, method of accessing the images and comparing outcomes. It was pretty cool. Still is. Product offering. We sold this on the basis of three core competencies. Advanced soft tissue imaging. Soft tissue imaging is a little funky when it comes to uh, imaging. It's hard. Uh, it's not the same as imaging uh, bone. Transmission and databases, and strong controls and efficiencies, three core competencies. Product, and we sold this on, uh, and a lot of this stuff took place here. This in particular uh, was really a Thayer Medical School product, and it was a wonderful product, uh, remains a wonderful product, and it's a product that no one will ever buy. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that at lunch today. But what this does is predict aneurysmal rupture. And when you think about it, I looked at this, I said, this is the greatest thing in the world, because you can predict which of these things are going to rupture or not. And it actually did a wonderful job. The problem is its utility is in small, questionable aneurysms. And from the clinician's perspective, if they have a small, questionable aneurysm, what's the first thing that they want to do? Do they want to take a detailed analysis and see if they want to treat it? Or do they just want to treat it? Boomer? The latter. They want to treat it. And why? Money. That is correct. That is how they get paid. It's a cynical view, but a correct one. Is a product stream of potential value? You've seen the product stream. What do you think? What's the value there? Anybody got a concept? What are people willing to pay for? Which are the core competencies of value? And what does that core competency group say about the management team? Let's go back to it just for a second. Advanced soft tissue imaging, databases, and controls and efficiencies. What are we really selling here? That's what we're after. And we're selling the company. So why is somebody going to buy it? 
You see that group of core competencies. You see the management team. They get this presentation from me. Why are they going to buy this thing? Well, they think it might reduce the amount of unnecessary surgeries, but from their perspective, they think we might make them some money. You know, one of the things that we were selling here was our ability to make you some money. Market opportunity. Very big deal in analyzing any company. What's the market it can play in? What's the market it's in today? What kind of growth does it have? Is it scalable? You know, one of the things you'll hear time and time again is this is a scalable operation. Can we enter markets cheaply? Can we have a big position in those markets when we get in them? Uh, these were numbers that we have been given in terms of uh, the number of procedures and the total number of cases that were available. Uh, we were told that there was 320,000 cases uh, available in the AAA and TAA commercial markets. Uh, and that was the basis that we went out and addressed the market to sell the company. We were at that time a five or six million dollar company. Looks like a big potential market. Uh, additional potential market with finite element and the clinical trials market. Additional target markets by additional uh, therapeutic areas, additional clinical areas, carotid. Big deal. They were just starting to do carotid stenting, uh, required advanced uh, analysis, which was a good target market. Oncology, it's a big market. And in oncology, we actually had some very cool technology which allowed for the differentiation of non-membrane bounded tissues in lesions. You know, typically a cancer lesion will have three or four different ty tissue types in it. And the efficacy of treatment really depends, those tissue types will change, one of the outcomes being scar tissue. Uh, we had some very cool technology in terms of the separation of those uh, tissue types out, because it's very difficult to tell if you've just got a big blob of tissue without uh, differential tissue types within it. You know, all healthy tissues in your body, if you look at a CT scan, all the healthy tissue are all very discreetly packaged in membranes. And it's only with diseased tissue that you get non-membrane packaged. What do you think about these markets? Anybody got an opinion? Huh? Good markets, okay. Do you think the future markets are for real? What do they depend on? CMS, that's exactly right. And that's one critical thing that when you're looking at a company like this, all those markets are real and we had products to go into those markets. But none of it was going to work without funding. And the funding depended on reimbursement and depended on reimbursement from CMS. I'll tell you that after we sold the company, some guys came in and did a market study. And at $10 million, as far as they were concerned, what percentage of the total market do you think we actually had? We had $10 million in sales in uh, the AAA market. Guesses? They told me it was 90%, if you can imagine. But it's the issue of segmentation. And it's one of the risks that when you see numbers like that on a presentation, they say, this is the total number of cases. And if, you know, so we have a big market in front of us. And the problem that we made, the mistake that we made, is we should have done that market work sooner. I really couldn't understand why we couldn't drive this thing any further in sales here. I mean, this thing had been growing like a weed, and it was starting to plateau out. And I couldn't understand why we weren't getting any more sales. The issue was, if you're at 80% of the market, you're tapped out. They told me it was 90%. I don't believe it, but um, you have to be very, very careful with those market analyses. Um, a little bit about preview, which was our 
paid for product this is a critical issue pricing you'll know where it is on the page all the other good stuff first what's the issue about price if you're dependent on CMS for reimbursement how much control do you have over your pricing correct zero this was a company which had a wonderful product which was enormously well received in the market which had tremendous technology development around it and had zero pricing power tough situation did it work this is uh, just an example uh, of a carotid surgery this is what an angiogram showed uh, this is what our uh, analysis showed with the thrombus turned off. This is with the thrombus turned on and this was the intraoperative photograph. It was a wonderful example of why our technology gives a much better idea of what was actually going on with the blood vessel than an angiogram. Gave extraordinarily accurate metrics. Wonderful job in terms of reading uh, the, met the anatomy for the fit and finish for stent graft placement. Manufacturer specific virtual device. This was a very cool product and it actually did help sales a lot. If you look here, this is a Gore product. This is a Medtronic product. Uh, I can't, uh, this is a uh, Zenith product. Um, all of these you could build within our software very efficiently and order online so that you could click, put it in, and it would best fit and then order for you. If you didn't like it, you could turn it around, change it. It was a really cool uh, feature and it did help drive some sales. We had our own workstation. Uh, the workstation was an integral part of our production process. Uh, it was proprietary to us, still is proprietary to the company today. Uh, finite element, I think I discussed this, but it was something that was done uh, out of here, out of there, and out of the medical school, and was a wonderful tool for rupture prediction. Actually did a great job. Computational fluid dynamics uh, was another thing that we did a lot of work with, uh, with Fluent when they were up here. Uh, this was a lot of fun for me. I learned a lot about fluid dynamics and working with this stuff. Uh, again, it had a fairly strong prediction capability in terms of rupture prediction, but without reimbursement was uh, going nowhere. Okay, now back to questions. Put yourself in uh, VC uh, mode again. Put on your venture capital hat. Ask some questions. In the presentation you've just seen, is there clarity about how these products are sold? Is there clarity about where they're going? Is there clarity about FDA clearance? Is there clarity about what CMS might think about that? Because these are really important questions if you actually want to sell the products. Getting, again, getting back to the original theme of this discussion, are these is technology enough? And if it's not, how do we do in these areas? Well, let me take a minute. FDA clearance. We went for FDA clearance on a couple of those, and it was extraordinarily difficult. They said you're going to need to run a full clinical trial, which would have been monstrously uh, complicated and expensive, and they weren't going to allow a 510K process on it. And CMS, without FDA clearance, it just simply wasn't going to happen data transmissions and databases, this part of the uh, production process. We had a uh, neat early stage piece of proprietary piece of technology for data transmission under protocol called the DICOM Armor Car. This has subsequently been, uh, not too surprisingly, replaced by a software only solution. Uh, it was a great piece of technology at the time. Uh, it's been replaced by a better piece of technology. It was a great enabling piece of technology, but 
uh, no one was willing to pay anything for it. This is a cool uh, descriptor of the production process, showing all the different parts bopping into line sequentially. Image downloaded, sent to MMS, uh, verified by the pay by the physician. Confirmation sent back. Data downloaded. Data uploaded. Processed. Read and measured and sent home via PEMS. Uh, it was a cool process. We had a lot of DACs installed around the country. PEMS was really a big deal. Yeah? By the time we sold the company, it was under a day. Today, it's under an hour. And to put in perspective in terms of making a company out of this, when we started that whole turnaround process there, that was a bimodal distribution of time, either 10 business days or forever, neither one of which was acceptable. Uh, by the time this was done, uh, we routinely would do everything under a day. Uh, today, we routinely do everything under an hour. Uh, it makes a huge difference in terms of customer satisfaction. It makes a huge difference in terms of uh, patient safety. But it's not enough to keep your customers in place if you don't have reimbursement. Uh, PEMS, I think I've talked about, but it was a HIPAA-compliant secure website, which gave doctors standardized longitudinal metrics on their patients. What this means is that if you had a patient come in, you decided to treat them, and you were given a group of metrics, you were given a model, you could pick the uh, exact specs, the exact uh, type of device that you wanted, fill it online, and then subsequently, get all of the standardized metrics to evaluate the outcomes. It is hot in here. It's, I mean, everybody melting? I'm fine, you know, yeah. Is it just me? Wow. Um, it included both uh, images and metrics. It was and is by far and away the largest uh, medical registry in the world, including radiographic images, based on radiographic images. I think today it's got 250,000 different patient encounters in it. Uh, competition, these were the workstations that we were up against, GE, Siemens, Philips. Uh, I think most people have heard of them. And then uh, some smaller uh, competitors. And you know it's important to remember that they could all participate in the same code, and we ended up with 80% of the market. So if you have the right product, uh, you can own the market. And it was interesting because we were the only shaded surface display volume rendered uh, technology out there. And the shaded surface display allowed for some very high precision metrics that simply weren't available otherwise. And it made a big difference. Future milestones. This is what we thought we were going to do when we sold the company. And it's interesting because every bit of what we planned to do depended on FDA clearance and depended on CMS uh, approval for additional reimbursement. OK, questions. What's of real value in these future products? That you, I mean, you've seen the product line. You've had a chance to take a look at it briefly. Some of the people have had a chance to read it. Is there clarity about products in the category? Is there clarity about FDA clearance? Any indication of where we were with CMS? And what's the go-to-market? Is there clarity about what the go-to-market here might be? And you know, the punchline on all this is these were a little bit pie in the sky. They were entirely dependent on two things. This is a company which clearly had the ability to take products to market. That wasn't the issue. 
It was clearly a company that had the ability to develop some great technology. That wasn't the issue. The issue was, was the FDA going to approve it, and was CMS going to pay for it? And if the answer to those was no, the rest of it didn't matter. Controls and efficiencies. Um, we had a core lab business and have a core lab business today. Uh, the company has a core lab business. Uh, core lab is engaged in image processing, radiographic image processing, in the support of clinical trials, clinical trials for drugs and devices. Uh, we had a very important position in the device world. Uh, this is a management team. Here's a relevant experience. All these com people had been uh, with the company or with similar companies for a long period of time. Financial overview. This was the commercial sales growth of preview. Uh, on a quarter-by-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, this was a business which was expanding very rapidly. Cases were up. Revenue was up. It was a fun place to be and a fun time to be doing it. Uh, we're growing at 80%. Uh, net income was growing very rapidly. EBITDA was growing very rapidly. Margins were expanding. And this company was spitting out cash. Uh, we were, you know, this was a little company, but it was generating as much as three or four hundred thousand dollars a month in cash by the time we sold it. Questions for the group here: What's driving the financial performance? You know, if you're sitting as a venture capitalist looking at this company, does this company have pricing power? It's got a tremendous position in the market. It's got great technology. It's got a good team of people that's worked together for a long period of time. Do they have any control over price? None. What's driving margin growth? Talk to me. More cases, absolutely. Volume? Efficiency. The business was getting more and more efficient all the time. I've given you some metrics. You know. When you put in place a quality system and take time out and reduce rejects, you end up with vast financial improvements. Uh, this was a company that had a 75% reject rate when I walked in the door. And when I left, it was 0.005%. Any other thoughts? What's driving uh, financial performance? Margin growth? We were just awful about expenses. I mean, no one traveled anywhere without a signed voucher. It was a tough place to work. But if we were going to sell this company, it was going to be sold on financial performance. And uh, you have to take a hard look at what you're going to sell the company on. And if it's financial performance, then you better perform. And perform we did. You've looked at the numbers here. What's the investment commitment to future products. We didn't spend much time on the financials. How much money were we putting in those products? Boomer? That's correct. Uh, Everything that you saw being done was done on a collaborative basis. It was done uh, on a wing and a prayer. There was some very cool technology, but uh, it was very difficult under the circumstances to make big capital commitments because we were trying to get this thing uh, in a condition for sale. Sales and marketing plans, fairly sketchy. We were driving it. It was very successful. People were buying into the sales growth. There was an implicit assumption that these folks knew what they were doing, and we did. We were moving the merchandise. But it was extremely difficult uh, to put in place long-term marketing plans around the two great limitations of the FDA and CMS. Return on investment, just to put in perspective, 
the company at the time I walked in the door had had $15 million put into it. We put another $8 million into it gross. And I think when we sold it, we had $5 million of cash on the balance sheet. So it was a very successful return on that investment. Uh, it didn't take net a lot of money to make the thing go. Capitalization, um, I don't think this really matters, but um, the one thing I will tell you about this company is it was the most convoluted capital uh, arrangement I'd ever seen in my life. I think that uh, it had been financed initially by a group of people uh, offering to sell stock in the company instead of to people at Grand Central Terminal. You could buy a beer to get on the train or go home, or you could buy some stock in the company, and they would, you know, you get one beer, you get two shares free. Uh, because there were hundreds of people in this. And when we sold the thing, I think we spent months trying to find everybody. We were tracking them down all over the world. I mean, you can't imagine. I, ultimately, we actually got everybody uh, and got them their money. Uh, this was, you know, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. This was the investment highlights at the end of the presentation. And data, knowledge, and results. There you have it. Uh, questions, comments? Yes, sir. You know, we sold fairly successfully in Sweden, uh, particularly to the Karolinska Institute. Uh, they had a capitated model, and it worked pretty well there. Uh, every place else we tried to sell was so convoluted, other than Sweden, in terms of access to direct payment, it just became very, very difficult. We sold uh, the clinical trials product very broadly and had probably, by the time I left, half of our business in that was coming from offshore. So it depended if it was a private payer, if it was a uh, clinical application. If it was a clinical trial application, it was very easy to sell offshore. If it was a uh, actual medical treatment application, it was very difficult to sell offshore. Yes, sir. Did you ever have to worry about the problem of a physician being sought for a case and then not being paid? Do you remember that? Or do you that? We weren't immune to it, and it did happen, but we actually found that. Uh, the vast majority of our customers would do pre-op and post-op. And so they wanted that post-op follow-up. And so they'd keep paying as long as there was uh, the expectation of uh, follow-up for their uh, patients. I think our bad debts were, they were very small, it was, you know, one or two percent. We ultimately got in a position, uh, after we sold the company, we became a Medicare provider. And the worst payer we ever had was Medicare, <laughs> by far and away. <laughs> we had more trouble getting the federal government to pay than we ever had any private people. Yes? You know, uh, we didn't, and the reason is, we were really in the post-processing world. Uh, we didn't have an application that worked on an intraoperative basis. Uh, we looked at a couple of deals after we sold the company for some intraoperative uh, MR applications, particularly for carotid, uh, but we never ended up pulling the trigger on them. Yes? Well, very much. There was a consistent failure of one type, and it's the single most common failure of CEOs in small companies. And that is they focused on raising more money to make payroll rather than raising revenue to make payroll. And if you don't have a revenue base, you will never have a company. And 
you know, the typical amount of patience somebody has with a CEO, the guy walks in, it's going to be great, you know, 18 to 24 months, if you don't have something going, you're out. And uh, there had been a revolving door. And the worst thing that had happened, and this required both uh, a lot of retraining of the existing staff and a lot of replacement of the existing staff, is people came to expect that as their role. You know, I walked in the door, I said, well, you got to go raise some equity because we need to make payroll. And I said, how about if we actually get some revenues to make payroll? How about that as an alternative? <laughs> Gee, I'd never thought of that. That's a great idea. We should try that. And it, you know, some people didn't buy into it. They, they didn't stick around. But uh, for those who did, it made, you know, it suddenly it became pretty clear that that's a much easier way to run a business. But that was a single greatest shortcoming. And I think that the average tenure of a CEO at the company prior to me showing up had probably been just over a year. Um, you know, fighting about all the wrong stuff. It's all about the commerce. It's all about being in the trade. It's all about making some revenues. It's all about uh, being in front of the customer and satisfying a customer. And if you look inwards, it's easy to be CEO because nobody beats you up as much. But ultimately, it's a short-term solution. Yes, Boomer. Yeah, actually, we sold this company, and I think we got, I don't know, call it 25 million bucks for it, something like that. And immediately after we sold it, we sold it on September 30th of 2005. We reached a deal to sell it February 1st of 2005. February 6th of 2006, uh, CMS uh, came out with a proclamation under the Deficit Reduction Act, which eliminated all reimbursement for this company and its prospective type of services forever and amen into the future. So for all of you folks that were interested in these markets, think about that for a minute. CMS can at any moment say, we're finished. And interestingly, uh, I managed to find someone that would actually pay 20% more than we'd sold it for <laughs> three months before. And the guys that, that bought it didn't want to sell it. They said they felt confident it'd be worth $150 million. So I, OK, it's up to you. Yeah, CMS's position is actually worse than that now. Uh, if you can imagine, CMS today has basically moved into a position of everything is moving into away from a fee-for-service. And the fundamental element that made this company work is a fee-for-service model. We'll provide the service, you provide the fee. Uh, everything is moving to uh, much more to the old DRG style format. Do people here know what DRG stands for? Diagnostic Related Groups. Diagnostic related groups were first used for inpatient care beginning in the mid 80s. It was thought to be the ruin of healthcare in America. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. These things never do, they just change. And everything is now moving very quickly towards the full adoption of DRGs and really moving away from fee for service from any format. So if you see any business plans that depend on fee for service, Put them there because. So we can pay them the DRG system, you know, some insurance will be like 50% of the patient or something to supply all the uh, analysis. Well, it, it's, it's typically done. What they do is you're typically selling into then a competitive market based on value. So somebody would say, we'll give you uh, $45,000 for. An, aortic aneurysm repair. We don't care how you do it. We don't care when you do it. But we're going to give you 45000 bucks, and that's the deal. And if you, they will opt it based on comorbidities. So if the person's over 85, if they're a smoker, if they're diabetic, it, it's to pay a little bit more. But uh, you then have to sell into the hospital as part of that DRG. So you've got to get a, a cut of that forty-five grand.
this was a this was a, a tragedy. One of the things that made this so difficult for me is I showed you that angiogram. Well, the angiogram uh, is fairly intrusive. It uh, has a lot of morbidity associated with it and occasional mortality. And uh, it's much more expensive and gives much worse data. And I went to CMS to get reimbursement the first time and said, well, you can use angiography, and it's more expensive and worse for the patient, gives worse data, or you can use this. And they said, well, and this is the truth, they said, well, we'd like to approve it, but if we do, you'll be in here next year asking for more, for something else. And I said, what's the matter with that? If it's cheaper and better, I said, what are you supposed to be doing? Their fundamental problem is they couldn't, there was no mechanism in the past to disallow the use of angiography. So what was happening is they were doing angiograms and our service. And it was simply increasing the absolute uh, dollar burden on, on uh, the patient. They weren't forced to make a decision. So we had a tremendous amount of peer-reviewed literature. A lot of it came out of here. It was extraordinarily helpful in getting uh, reimbursement. But at the end of the day, uh, it didn't really matter because under the structure of CMS at the time, they couldn't disallow an inferior technology. They cannot. And it's a central, centerpiece of what uh, my next company is doing to a large degree. Uh, they've just put in place the concept of comparative effectiveness research. And for any of you folks who are interested in outcome-based research, it's really the cutting edge of where medicine's going. You know, there are any device or drug which is approved by, uh, by the FDA is basically good forever. And it may be a much worse product than something that comes out subsequently. And it may actually have much higher reimbursement. But there's no way for CMS to stop paying for it and there's no way for uh, the FDA to pull it from the market. And one of the things that's going on with the new health care bill is a huge push for comparative effectiveness uh, around uh, outcomes. So there is today, or there is coming today, but there isn't at this point, Boomer. Yes? We kept it in cash, and we, you know, we used it. Uh, it's important to note that cash balances go down like that, and they then should start going like that. And ours did. You know, anytime you get a company like this up and going, you need working capital. You're going to generate receivables. Receivables in the medical business can run to six months. So you've got six months of revenue stuck out there, which, in our case, was money good. You know, directly to your question. But it's money that's hanging out there. And with a new company like this, it was extremely difficult to go to a bank and get them to uh, provide any financing for that. And this was also directly after the tech crash in the uh, 2000, 2001 time frame. So nobody was lending. You know, If you walk in the door and say, I've got a technology company, uh, basically it's here's your hat, where's your hurry, pal? Get out of here. Uh, they had no interest in talking to us. So equity financing for uh, working capital purposes was really the only way to do it. It's interesting. Uh, this was a very difficult sale. Uh, we went out to 450 potential buyers and got one real expression of interest. And we talked them up 20% and sold it to them. And that was quite a game of poker. <laughs> they were the deal. They were the game. And, uh, and they bought it. But it's, it's really important. Uh, we went out to a lot of people and spent a lot of time trying to do it and found one person that was willing to, to play. Right, right. At the end of the day, you know, 
the more sophisticated buyers uh, understood all of the issues around uh, Medicare, understood all the issues around the FDA, and it was difficult for them to make a positive buying decision. Uh, at lunch today, somebody asked a good question, which is, how about the Stengraft manufacturers? How about them? And one of the problems was that the FDA had been making noise that if you buy this, uh, this will be included as part of the definition of your product. And you will always have to provide this product with yours. So these guys were not buyers. So uh, it ended up being sold on its financial characteristics. And that is why we worked so hard on, uh, on pushing those financial characteristics. And we ended up selling it to a private equity group. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks, everybody.